also being recorded. Great. So we're streaming with a HDR wireless live streaming plugin from a Ricoh Theta Z1. The stream should be at 24 frames per second. Uh, we reduced it slightly in order to um, hopefully have a smoother stream here. The HDR wirelessly streaming plugin is made by Low Tours. It's one of um, the plugins that works inside of the Ricoh Theta Z1. And we're here with Jesse Kasman and Craig Oda. Hello there. If you're watching in 360, which you are, I might be on the other side of the screen. You can grab and move around within the 360 degree sphere. Yep, that's me over here. So we're somewhat new to live streaming events in 360, so if there's a question, just pop it into the chat window and we'll try to answer the questions about the Ricoh Theater cameras or about live streaming trends in general. We've been working with live streaming in 360 for about seven years, starting with the Ricoh Theta S, which streamed in 2K and required a special driver to stitch it on the computer. The current model we're using, the Ricoh Theta Z1, does in-camera stitching. It's running an Android operating system inside of it with a Qualcomm Snapdragon chipset, which uh, adds quite a bit of additional um, power to it. Okay, so if we have a question that's coming into the chat windows, we're going to prioritize it. Also, this will be archived, so hopefully you'll be able to see it. We've collected a number of questions over the years with uh, streaming. So 360 streaming to YouTube and Facebook is rather a, uh, it's a broad topic, right? So there's many different ways to stream. The current stream you're watching is coming over Wi-Fi in an office, and the plugin is running inside of the camera. But there's other methods, USB, um, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi with mobile data, and uh, you could go on and on. So, so Jesse, what's some of the differences between the different streaming methods? Yeah, well, uh, one of the main things you might want to consider is the physical setup. Uh, USB. You want to get closer to the camera? Maybe right? I'll get even closer. Great. Um, the, the microphone's not that great. So I, I think we want to speak pretty close to the camera. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, so we were talking about the difference between USB, uh, Wi-Fi, um, uh, live streaming. And uh, I, I was starting to talk about um, maybe the, the main differences that you'll notice right away are in hardware. If it's, use, if it's USB, you're connected to a laptop. Um, and it uh, depends, we've seen this used in entertainment and other areas where the uh, live streaming is from a set position, so it's not a problem. But um, we also uh, have seen live streaming where uh, you absolutely want it to be mobile and uh, want to be able to move around. So uh, that's one of the first big differences uh, if you have a cable attached or if you don't. Okay, so um, I think one of the issues with wireless live streaming, uh, in my opinion, is the heat. So the if it's going over the USB cable, because it's not using the Wi-Fi chipset internally to the camera, you could disable the Wi-Fi chipset. It's really possible for the camera to um, be uh, a lower heat uh, right. dissipation. So in I think with the Z1, with this plugin that we're using from Flow Tours, it is capable of streaming for many hours, I, I feel. But uh, in certain conditions, especially if you're using a different camera model, uh, you may want to use the USB cable if your application does allow it. Uh, I think there's several other differences with the USB cable versus Wi-Fi. Um, the latency is likely about the same, but uh, the Wi-Fi, you can have a variable frame rate. For example, this stream is using 24 frames per second. You can do it uh, even lower, like uh, 15 frames per second, to kind of tune it to your specific needs. Uh, also, the, the um, USB cable is locked at uh, 30 frames per second. 
Yeah, we have found that changing the frame rate um, depends on the use case, but you may not notice the difference going from 30 frames per second down to even 15 frames per second or even lower. Depends on what you need it for, but uh, you can save potentially on heat issues uh, while not really compromising quality. So what are some of the other considerations if they're deciding whether to use Wi-Fi or USB or, or mobile or uh, mobile or Wi-Fi? Yeah, it, it depends a lot on the exact use case. Um, for example, uh, we had a developer in the Theta 360 doc guide who set up a um, live streaming in an ice hockey rink, so in a sports event. You may have a fixed position that you're working from, and uh, uh, so this is fine to have a cable attached and the camera is central, it's 360, and so it can see in all directions, uh, and so that may work very well. Uh, the author of this exact plugin that we're using right now uh, focuses his service on museums. He likes, uh, he's working to give uh, tours. So you walk through locations, I believe both outdoors and indoors. Um, and so therefore, obviously, uh, it would be very hard to be tethered to a laptop. Uh, so I guess it, uh, that's kind of a main consideration is actually what you're doing. Um, so is there a difference in quality uh, so if someone's looking for quality, is there a difference in quality between the USB cable and Wi-Fi? Um, I don't have an exact answer for this. Uh, Craig, maybe you have more details to add. I believe that they are uh, comparable in a lot of ways. And so you, you might think, oh, Wi-Fi, I don't know, ha uh, has more trouble sending data regularly or more issues uh, dropping uh, frames. Um, I don't think that's always the case. Uh, yeah. so, so I think the color, because he's using HDR with this particular plugin for flow tours, is it, it's quite good. Uh, it, it may even be better than the USB cable. Um, although I guess you could process it on the laptop that's going to do the USB cable. Uh, there does appear to be some stitching issues, like the stitch line exactly where the, the two spheres meet uh, with the current versions of, of Wi-Fi. So that, if it's looking for a very precise stitch, uh, which you might need for uh, AI processing, uh, that, so that, that might need some improvement. I think yeah. most of the people using um, AI processing right now are um, using the USB cable, although that, that could change. Uh, okay, so the next question. Unless we've got something here. Okay, last one is saying is earplugs are down. We just want to make sure that everyone can hear us okay. Uh, we do have some concurrent users online here. Okay, okay so between Mac, Windows, and Linux, uh, and direct from the camera, like, what's the difference? Uh, well, okay, maybe I'll focus first on direct from the camera. So if you're not familiar with the Theta, it has the ability to um, install a program. It's called a plug-in, a small Android uh, program within the camera. Uh, this uh, makes uh, use can be very hands-free. Uh, it's rather nice. Um, Rico has released um, a wireless live streaming plug-in that's free and can be used and installed in the camera, and they have produced several updates, uh, so it's continually improving. Beyond that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the pl pl plugin we're using right now by Laszlo Vargas um, has built on that and done quite a bit with uh, frame rate, uh, heating, and other issues, and so, um, it's really quite a, a different animal from running it uh, on a Mac or, or Windows. Um, so I, I guess I can provide maybe a little bit more information. Yeah, please. So the Mac, you don't need a different driver to run it. So if you plug the 
the Ricoh uh, Theta camera into the, the Mac, you're going to see it as a, like a webcam. And you could use something like OBS or QuickTime to manipulate the live stream that way. If you're on Windows, you're going to require a separate driver that you need to download from the RicoThetas360.com uh, site and install the driver. It's only going to work on, I believe it only works now on 64-bit Windows 10. So if you're using Windows 7, you won't be able to use it. But you do require this different software on Windows. You also require additional software on Linux. So although it is using a form of libuvc on Linux, that's been uh, modified, uh, you have to get the driver and compile it from source code. So it's a fair bit more involved on, on Linux. However, it, is, it does seem to be pretty popular. Uh, if you're comfortable with things like compiling from source code, it does appear to work pretty, pretty well from Linux. You can stream from these smaller board computers like a Jetson Nano. And so as Jesse mentioned, from direct, direct from the camera, you do have to use a plugin. The one we're using, uh, Flow Tours, HDR Wireless Live Streaming plugin, is currently free. There's a number of other ones that are available for free or as a, a paid service. So you can go to the plugin store and grab it uh, from there. Okay. Yeah, uh, just an extra comment on Linux. Uh, we have seen quite a bit of developers in robotics um, be using live streaming uh, for different uh, uh, uses on, on top of robotics. Often it's to provide uh, visual data back, but there are things being done with um, depth and 3D uh, uh, imaging. Um, uh, yeah, so there, uh, it's used regularly with Linux. Uh, I think, uh, Craig, you mentioned uh, NVIDIA uh, Jetson and those other types of small board computers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but quite a bit of uh, action in the robotics field. So this question is about the software that we need to stream um, and which camera to use, like wh which, which is the best camera to use. Uh, do you want to take this one? Yeah, um, so probably uh, Z1 is a great choice in a lot of cases. Uh, it's the uh, highest quality uh, model from Ricoh and it can stream indefinitely. Um, uh, yeah, I completely agree. I think if you're gonna stream, you should use the Z1. The Theta X currently has some heat uh, dissipation issues. It does have that beautiful uh, LCD screen yeah. on it. Yeah. However, if you're, are, if you're buying the camera for streaming, I would say you have to go with the Z1. Yeah, I agree. Oh. The, the X is uh, tempting because it's the newest and like you said, big LCD, removable battery, uh, other things about it. But for live streaming, it's, it's uh, not the right choice. Yeah, this is my personal opinion. Uh, this is not the Rico, by the way. We don't, we don't work for Rico, by the way. We're outside consultants. So uh, if, if someone just to ask me uh, for a solid advice, I'd probably say the Z1, even though it is a little bit more expensive than the Theta X, because the internal guts of the camera is actually producing less heat. So you have that compared to the X. In addition, the X has the LCD screen. And then the uh, Z1 appears to have a slightly better heat dissipation, although you can use the X for streaming. Um, it, it does appear to work fine. Uh, currently, there are some problems with heat in certain circumstances. Uh, it appears you can stream the Z1 for 24 hours. In fact, we've been live streaming this uh, Z1 uh, for quite some time now, and it looks fine over the, the Wi Fi. Nice. Okay. Just the the X would probably overheat at this point with over uh, Wi Fi. Right, right, right. Um, but, you know, we're, we're working on trying to improve the heat uh, situation. Yeah. Uh, Craig, I got a couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, what are the trends of using a VR headset like the Oculus Quest 2 versus a web page? So I think almost everyone's using it on a web page, in my personal opinion. I think that using the uh, headset, it's still early days. Uh, this is just a, a personal uh, opinion right now. 
So um, it, it is possible to use it. There are these problems with VR uh, sickness and other things. And I think that the time for the Oculus Quest 2 may be uh, yet to come. Do, do you have an opinion about like what the breakdown is between headsets versus web pages? Yeah, uh, I think it's really cutting edge, bleeding edge with uh, VR goggles at this point. It's a little bit old, but I worked with the PlayStation VR headset, uh, PS VR, on PlayStation 4. Uh, imported Rico videos and images, and it, it's certainly fun mm -hmm. to be able to look around and see things on a personal level, go take some pictures and come back. But uh, realistically, setting up the whole headset uh, just to view images. Mm -hmm. And then that's just personal. For a business interest, it just really was uh, too soon. Uh, it was not a realistic setup, uh, both in cost or uh, any kind of uh, ability to set it up easily. But I think that innovators, it, it always has to be in a non-working state or else you wouldn't be an innovator, right? So yeah. maybe the time has come. Yeah. I guess we can probably talk about Connexus a little bit, right? Because it's, it's been announced. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, they are focused on the headset, right? Yeah. Uh, Connexus, uh, I believe it's pronounced Connex, okay. Connex. Um, is a company out of Japan that's working to um, do live entertainment in the metaverse. And so they use 360 degree cameras um, placed up on stage in these yep. live events. And uh, the viewer uh, gets this stream in VR goggles. I believe they can also stream to mobile if you don't have goggles uh, available. But um, uh, it's a cool idea where you can be in an immersive experience and jump up on stage. You can be in front of the, if it's, uh, for example, a band, mm -hmm. be in front of the band or in middle of the band or behind the band and look around. You can choose uh, from, I believe, five different perspectives. Yeah, I think they're using five uh, live streaming cameras, 360 live stream cameras simultaneously uh, into an Oculus Quest 2 headset. Yeah, this is my understanding. The, the CEO of Connex uh, also was the original inventor, I believe, of the Ricoh Theta, right? He was. He's, um, like you said, he's a real uh, innovative uh, guy, and he did. He was involved in the um, building the original Ricoh Theta mm -hmm. cameras, mm -hmm. and now he's doing uh, this new venture. And I think he's really kind of pushing the, the edge, and it's pretty exciting stuff in entertainment. So, you know, I guess the uh, Facebook is making some pretty big investments in the metaverse, right? It's in the, uh, what, what, what is it, billions? Or it's, it's billions. So, it's bil big. billions, right? Yep. And so, you know, the fact that everyone's using the web page now, I, I, I don't know what's gonna happen next year. It's quite possible that yeah. the headsets will finally take off. Yeah. Like, like what's, what is current today may not be what's current uh, tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty clear. Uh, yeah, I think uh, currently Facebook's getting negative press and where's it going and what's the next step, but that is, as you point out, exactly what you know innovation does. It's trying to build something that didn't exist before. Uh, it's not easy uh, by definition. So. Okay, so yeah, I'm looking at the uh, camera and the thermometer warning light uh, just went on at the temperature, but I think we're just gonna power forward. Uh, this generally does happen okay. after um, maybe 15 to 30 minutes of use, but uh, we're, we're just gonna run it until we get to a thermal shutdown. Yeah. There's no fan on this thing right now. Okay. Um, so what, what about some of these use cases? You mentioned uh, the sporting events. So yeah. I remember that one at the hockey rink, they're only using a single lens, right? That's, so That's right, uh, yeah, right. It was 180. Currently we can't actually stream a single lens from the uh, Ricoh Theta, but that might be possible in the future with the plugin. Uh, so half of that, the stream was not used, right? Because it was right up against the uh, backboard of the hockey rink. Right. Uh, we have had people try to uh, tether the thing from the, the roof of a sporting event, uh, but it's been somewhat difficult of where to place the camera. Yeah. Uh, 
the one you're thinking about was against the, the wall. Was there another example other than the hockey rink? Uh, there, there was a soccer. It was on the side. but uh, That's right. That's right. It's kind of, it was kind of difficult to see the players. Like, you know, the hockey was pretty good. I think the reality is that, um, like most sports fields, they're, they're kind of large, and you're used to regular TV with close-ups and multiple cameras around the edges and uh, on top end. So streaming from one location in a sporting event ends up being pretty unfulfilling. Mm -hmm. the, the people, the main thing that you're interested in, end up looking pretty far away. Okay. Um, uh, we did have other examples. I, I'm stuck on the ice hockey rink one because I like ice hockey. But, what were the other examples? Uh, there was the soccer one. Uh, I think they had some problems with actual implementation. Though, yeah, right? yeah, I think they did. There's also this issue of uh, a soccer ball or a football potentially hitting the camera right? if it's on the sidelines. Which is very real. Oh. If you get close enough to the action, uh, it's excellent uh, lenses and oh. uh, sensors and stuff. It's fragile, just like any good camera. So you, it's, it's definitely important to so take that into account. So the account. example I saw for Connexus were using uh, music events, and they have four cameras on stage, right? Plus yeah. there's one hanging from the roof. I believe so. Because I, I guess a music event is a, it's kind of a, a more structured environment. It's a smaller space than a, a sporting event. Yeah. Uh, so we've seen more successful implementations at music events, not just from the Connexus and the bands that they're representing, but also yeah. um, a, a, a number of other bands, right? So that this, this use of the camera to stream uh, music events seems to be relatively popular right now. It's a good point. Uh, it's much more structured that way, mm -hmm. entertainment. Uh, maybe I could imagine a band running around crazily, but in general, I think they're probably, they're performing. They're in control of what they're doing. Oh. The stage is a set space that's different from a sporting event. I also remember uh, streaming from a, like an art exhibit. Mm -hmm. uh, there was sort of contemporary art uh, I, I don't know if you remember this, but... Um, with a robot? With a robot yeah. moving around from room to room, mm -hmm. I believe, yeah. and showing off different things. That also was, in a way, fairly controlled, because mm -hmm. uh, it's not people running around, uh, uh, not as much, maybe. I think there were more than one example of live streaming uh, at a museum from a robot. Yeah. The, the robot is almost part of the exhibit, right? The, the robot itself is part of the art event. So the, the people there yeah. can see what the robot is seeing, right? They're, they're interacting with the robot. Right, 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 right. Th that's what you're thinking about, right? Yeah, that was the one, yep. Uh, so that that could be an example at the art, but in, in those cases, the ones you're referring to, the, the, the robot is part of the art. Like, the robot itself is an exhibit, right? Okay. It's, it's, yep. uh, it's not, Going through and just you know showing people like under COVID or something where you can access the museum, right? Which uh, was what we we're hoping for, but uh, as far as I know, this this never actually materialized where they, they could control a robot going around a yeah. a museum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there was also a series of uses of the live streaming for sales events, like trying to sell houses, for example. Right. If you recall, both on robots, on flying drones. Yeah human beings, yep. uh, did anything come to mind for you that it was very interesting? Yeah, uh, there was a, a real estate company that uh, wanted to have a robot uh, build the virtual tours. And uh, it was helped by COVID because it was kind of obvious that mm -hmm. you would more likely do a kind of hands-off virtual mm -hmm. tour of a a property. Was the virtual tour still images or was it a live stream? Uh, what do you mean by virtual tour? I, I believe it was live stream. A live stream, right. Yeah. Um, and it had multiple advantages that you could do tours uh, day and night. So they were imagining international sellers. Mm -hmm. uh, it could do constant tours. So whereas an agent... Are, are, you're talking about the one that they were controlling, that, like the, the buyer yeah. could, could uh, control the robot. Yeah. And so, basically, you could like fly or drive the robot into a a luxury space yep. and inspect it at their leisure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That one. Uh, I think some of the other advantages were that the 
the robot can collect data or stay location for a long period of time, whereas a human being, you know, like a, a real live uh, tour uh, sales agent, would only be there for maybe like I don't know an hour or something, right? That's whereas right. Uh, a robot could be there for days and record the sound yeah. and other things within the space. Yeah, if there was change in lighting during the day or a train that goes by and makes extra yeah. noise, you might not notice it during the one yeah. hour, but over yeah, 24 hours or something, you could understand better what the space was like. So there was also this concept which both underwater and on land of experiential guided tours. Yeah. I mean, the camera has been streaming from of submarines you know, both for uh, surveillance as well as kind of experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, entertainment. Um, you know, smaller submarines, right, like these drone type submarines, uh, as well as giving a kind of a virtual tour, right? Either with live guides or with robots, right, right. Do you recall any that uh, stands out in your mind? Yeah, uh, there was a project in Japan with a small undersea robot. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was with a cable. It was tethered with a cable. It tethered with a cable, right? Yeah. So. It had a, um, I think there was like some type of like underwater technology, which I'm not super familiar with, but it had a, a transmitter um, right. that could go underwater. So I, I'm not, yeah, it, it, was, it was a slightly different technology. I yeah, think. but I think that was for scientific research. Yeah, I, I think for like inspection, where it was cheaper to send a robot than a human. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that seemed pretty great. And I think there was the other one, they were streaming it uh, for experience and they, were, they had it at a large event. Yeah. Do you remember this? Yeah, I do. I think it was in, um, I think South America. Uh huh. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. And they, they, they had like, a, like a, a summary robot for experience. And they, I think they put it on some like large screen. Right, right, right. Yeah, I remember this. It, it was like a live event, a uh, live stream. Yeah. Okay. Pretty cool. Um, Let's see, what do you think about the trend between a robot as a tour guide versus a human as a tour guide? Well, uh, I think there's some real advantages and f for having a robot. So it, I think we just covered some of them where it, it might be tireless, it mm -hmm. might be more meticulous, mm -hmm. it uh, maybe could scale more, that yeah. you could potentially show more places. Uh, if you're already live streaming, doing it remote, then the robot really might be uh, excellent to uh, you know, move around through the space. I think there's a real argument to be made that the uh, person moving is going to make good decisions, yeah. maybe where to show things. It's literally more personalized. Uh, so I guess you could come down on both sides of that. But it uh, seems like real potential for robots. You, you were talking about now sort of showing off a space. There's also the robots in construction where you just need to um, photograph and document a space. Mm -hmm. And wow, it seems like there would be a real advantage there. You don't have to use a human, but the robot can really grab a space, do it re uh, over and over. And uh, uh, yeah. So a lot of the examples are robots. Yeah. So are you kind of like, not bullish on humans. You you want to give in uh, robotic examples, right? Right. I guess uh, you don't believe in humans uh, as, a, as a guy. I guess I'm uh, excited about robots. Okay. I, I think um, it's. What, what do you think the trend is? Do you think it's toward robots or humans? Um, I think humans are here to stay. So I think that that's not uh, changing too quickly. No, as a tour guide for a live stream. As a tour I mean, guy. I think humans will, will be here, but what I think yeah. we're, uh, we're trying to delve into is it better to build a business with humans as the tour guide or as robots? Like, yeah. what, what do you think the trend is? Um, it's clear that people are experimenting with robots. Yeah. And um, I, I guess I personally don't know if the cost benefit is there. Uh, a robot seems to me to be expensive and maybe it breaks down a lot. Uh, so compared to a human and building a business, probably you can hire a person and start making money mm -hmm. uh, more easily. But uh, but like a, a human has many advantages over a robot, right? Like that, 
a, a human being has a personal connection to another human being. Yeah. So if you're a docent at a museum, yeah. uh, and it's a, you know, the, the human, uh, let's say a, a person very knowledgeable yeah. art, yeah. Um, can answer questions about the art yeah. and you know, talk about the, the art at, and in a, in a live event, right? So yeah. we're, we're talking about a, a, live, a live event here. Yeah. Um, whereas the robot will just have a database of information. So I, I think the human is, uh, has still very much a, a role in this future of yeah. what's happening with live streaming. I don't think it's all gonna go to the robots. And I would, I would personally like to see more humans um, get involved and yeah. try to take over the job of, of the robot and you know rely on the the benefits of being a human, which yeah. is you have your personality, you have a, you can answer the questions in different ways yeah. and uh, be be more creative. Yeah, uh, I, I do agree that a lot of the research has been on on robots, but as far as a trend, I I believe that the humans will make a comeback and be able to uh, take over some of the work that's being done by, by, by robots, especially yeah. in those cases where it's experiential or yeah. it's a, there's some entertainment value yeah, yeah. Or, or education. Yeah, I think I uh, disagree. I think the trend is to um, scale it with good enough information. Mm -hmm. I think the high touch and personality of a human is fantastic when you get it, mm -hmm. but that the vast majority of people are okay with getting information from a database mm -hmm. and getting a generalized tour or generalized information. Well, it's an exciting role. I guess we'll see what happens, but I, I guess you, as you can see, like uh, maybe like what Connexus is doing with music and stuff like that. Obviously, if it's just a robot playing the music, yeah. right? Uh, in, in some ways, those people, it's a live stream, right? With, yeah. with humans yeah. uh, or a sports game, right? Yep. I mean, if it's just robots doing the sports game, it's not as interesting. So I think that humans have a, uh, a very big role, I, I feel, in the future of live streaming. Although it could, you know, I agree, it could be all, all robots uh, in the future. <laughs> we'll see what happens. So let's talk about the audio. Uh, what's going on with the audio? Um, okay, well, uh, assuming you can hear the audio, uh, you can live stream with audio. It's uh, not spatial audio. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I think it's mono. It's I think it's, in audio. fact, it's not only not spatial, but it's mono. Yeah. Uh, so if the sort of depth of sound is important to you, uh, the current um, Ricoh Theta models don't support that. Uh, but I think the Ricoh Theta cameras, like the, it does support spatial audio, but you can't stream it. You can't stream it. Uh, well, you can stream it, but I believe it's a limitation of Facebook and YouTube that there's no standardization for spatial audio. So when you stream it, something on the other end has to be able to receive the stream. So the, the Theta X only has, um, I, I think it's mono, right? But yeah. I think the, the, doesn't the Z1 have four mics on it? it I does. think it does, right? Yeah, it does. I think the Z1, the V and the Z1 have spatial audio. So it's not a limitation of the camera. I think it's a limitation of the receiving technology. Uh, okay. And it's possible to live stream spatial audio if the server on the other side has spatial audio, but I don't know of an example uh, that, that has this. For video from file, YouTube does support uh, spatial audio. Okay. We, we've heard it, right? All right. Uh, taken with the Rico Theta cameras. So. Uh, but maybe not for live streaming right now. As far as I know, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think it's possible. Okay, uh, so the power from the camera during the live stream, we've been streaming yep. here for 34 minutes. The camera's uh, close to 100%. It's powered from a USB cable, which is plugged into a wall. Yeah. Uh, people are using an external battery as well to, to stream it. So you could use a battery inside the camera or you could uh, stream it from an external battery. Uh, I think some of the selfie sticks have the battery built into the selfie stick too. Um, oh, actually I can see that. Yeah, so the guy in Hong Kong, that he's taking the 8K video, oh, yeah. video file. That's right. He, he posted a lot about the selfie sticks that have uh, the battery is built into it. That's right. 
So a USB cable runs from the selfie stick uh, to the camera. I, I think there's a fairly large charge in it, right? There's a, yeah. I think it can stream for a long time. Uh, okay, should we keep going on then? You got more? Yeah, there's a lot more. We don't have to cover it all. Uh, so the latency. Yeah. Um, do you want to ask, ask me the questions or? Yeah, how about I ask about okay. it? Uh, so what's the latency like? And what's the lowest possible latency if I stream, you know, sort of in a confined location? Uh, streaming with RTMP to something like Facebook or uh, YouTube, you're going to get several seconds of latency. Like, so it's going to be maybe 10 seconds, right? So we're talking a pretty significant delay uh, if you're trying to do any type of telepresence or something like that. If you're using a, a web RTC server, which is not Facebook or YouTube, because I, don't, I don't think they support it, uh, you could get it down to under a second. Uh, you might be able to get it down to maybe uh, 500 milliseconds. Uh, it, it's possible to get it potentially lower. The, the lower so there's a limitation on the, the lower end, which is going to be 200 milliseconds, roughly, uh, because the camera is processing the, uh, the stream internal to it. So you, you won't be able to get lower uh, than that. And also with RTMP, you will have more latency. If you do stream with WebRTC, you can get much lower latency, but uh, you need a server to, uh, to handle that. Uh, so the, you know, these video chat, so if you're using like, you know, like whatever these things are, like, like Zoom or any type of chat, you can see that the, the video latency is quite low. It's much lower than this type of live stream with YouTube. Right. But that's not the technology that's used for this type of live event on uh, YouTube or Facebook. Uh, actually, this one comes up a fair amount. Can, is it possible to synchronize two cameras to build a stereoscopic? No, you can't do it. Yeah. yeah the, uh, the stereoscopic vision that's where the, uh, there's no way to set a clock. You need a specialized um, yeah. camera uh, for this. And um, the Ricoh Theta does not have these type of clocks in it. So as far as I know, uh, you can't, you won't be able to get the level of synchronization that is required for stereoscopic vision processing. It might be okay for a human being to view it with two lenses, and uh, the, uh, th there was a Twin Cam Go, yeah. which did have two cameras, yeah. but it's for a human being to view it in stereo, not, not a machine. So I guess you can do it in Twin Cam Go, but it was for a human being to look and get the depth of field for a human being. Yeah. Not, not for uh, machine processing to measure the, the depth in a great deal of uh, yeah, yeah. Like reliability. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they want to have it in stereo to measure the distance, and it's not possible. Yeah. You, you, need, you need a separate camera for this. Okay, another one. How about uh, Ethernet? Can you stream over Ethernet, and can you power it over Ethernet? You can stream over Ethernet, but the Ricoh Theta Z1, it, uh, you can power it, I'm oh, sorry, not with the Z1, the Ricoh Theta X. Yeah, the X, so, right. Yeah, that's right, uh, I made a mistake. So the, the Ethernet does not work with the Z1 or the Theta V. You have to get the X with a USB-C adapter, um, and you can power it indefinitely. The trick here is that you need to supply over 500 milliamps, so you're going to require maybe 800 milliamps. So normal USB-C uh, port on most computers only goes up to 500 milliamps. The camera will drain and you won't be able to uh, stream indefinitely. The camera port, need, or the, the, the laptop port needs to be um, BC 1.2, so battery charging 1.2 compliant, which most ports are not compliant with uh, battery charging 1.2 uh, specification. So uh, you might have to plug it into uh, a wall outlet. 
So this is plugged into a wall outlet on the battery charge is probably 100 percent. So yeah. um, if you use a USB-C adapter with pass-through uh, charging and you plug the one of the ports into the, the wall outlet, you should be able to charge, you should be able to stream indefinitely. Uh, okay, similar question, but for uh, USB. Um, and this is more problematic, right? Because uh, this question is probably, can I power it from my laptop indefinitely, right? So you get into more of a problem when you're it's plugged into a Raspberry Pi, a Jetson Nano, or a laptop. Right. And the camera will start draining, losing power slightly over that USB cable. Uh, you can use a powered hub. So if your laptop doesn't support battery charging 1.2 on that USB port, you can get a powered hub. And the, the powered hub you get has to support battery charging 1.2. Not all of them do. Right, so you, you'd probably want to look for the specification. And if you're having problems with it dropping, get an inline current meter and measure it. If the thing is not over 500 milliamps, the, the charge will drop. And you can get maybe eight hours or nine hours of streaming over uh, most laptops, but it, it won't be 24 hours. So unless you use this other, it could be very cheap, right? Like 20, 30 bucks for a powered hub, but it has to be a certain type of powered hub that can supply the current. So in my experience, the ports on the Raspberry Pi, and the, uh, the Justin Nano, it's not supplying enough current for the camera. Yeah, um, run into this one a fair amount. Uh, can I, so if I'm live streaming with USB, can I turn on the camera over USB? Yeah, I think then, you know this one. You want to take it yourself? Uh, sure. Yeah. So uh, you can. Um, um, so you need to uh, cycle the power on the USB ports. You can do this with software. So it's not a very clean fix. Right. But it is possible to do it. Uh, but and we have some code samples for Raspberry Pi and Jetson Nano. To, but it is basically you're setting the ports, the USB port, the software. So you can't specify an individual, a single USB port. It has to be, uh, it's probably going to be all of them or a, a bunch of them. It's not just that one port. So. You may mess up the other sensors you have attached to your a robot or other things. So it is, although it's possible, you either have to turn on and off the computer that the the theta is plugged into or the USB cable, or you can software uh, re reset the USB port. Yeah, and it, it will wake up from uh, yeah. yeah from part off state. Okay, similar question. Can I wake the camera up from sleep over USB? Uh, this is usually no problem. There is a USB API to do this. Uh, there is a problem that the the command to re uh, the command to wake it up may be coming in too quickly. So there's a modification, uh, at least on Linux, to um, which most people are sending the USB API command or from to uh, libptp2 to set a delay when you send the, the wake up from sleep command. Uh, so if you're having a problem waking the camera up from sleep with the USB API, uh, you can post a question here on the forum. We can show you where the modification is. Uh, you do need to set a small delay of uh, maybe like a second or something, maybe less. Okay, so we had a question about audio earlier, um, about spatial audio. This one's, uh, can you connect an external microphone? I think you can with a Theta X uh, from a, uh, uh, a plugin. So we've tested the plugin with the Theta X, not with the Z1 or the V. And it does appear to, uh, it, it does appear to work. The, but we haven't tested it with streaming. So you can connect a, a Bluetooth microphone. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, to the Theta F, which we've tested yeah. uh, successfully, uh, it appears to work fine from a plugin. Right. But that plugin that we tested wasn't doing the streaming. I think you have to, the developer has to put something about a media manager or something in there. It's not automatically going to work. Although it does appear to be technically possible to set your plugin up to use an external microphone. If you just plug an external microphone in or a Bluetooth microphone, it does not appear to work. Okay, uh, next one we also hear, um, can you stream from multiple cameras and switch between them, uh, among them? Uh, so the switching and the support for it is done on the computer that the, the lap, the, um, so if you're using a USB cable, um, it's handled by the, what is the USB cable plugged into from the, you know, connecting the camera to the laptop. So let's say that you're using, like say a Windows laptop, you, you can do this with the newest driver. You can select multiple devices and stream it and then flip between it using OBS. Uh, we haven't, I, I haven't tested it with something like Unity, but I, I guess it must work, right? Because I think uh, Connexus does have it flipping between five different cameras. Yeah, it does. So there's probably a way to um, flip between the cameras. It's technically possible. Uh, I've done it with OBS manually, uh -huh. but I think what you probably want to do is you're within a virtual space and you're flipping between the cameras. So I've seen it done, but I've actually never done it myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're controlling with the uh, controllers, right, within the VR headset. Okay. So that you have a much wider space, right? Yeah. And you can do different perspective of the audience. Yeah. Okay, next one is uh, the situation with heat. What's the current status? The Z1 appears to be, you can stream it uh, for more than 24 hours, either with the USB cable. Right. Uh, I haven't tested it for 24 hours with Wi-Fi, although it, it does appear that you can stream it. Uh, the Wi-Fi is definitely generating more heat than the USB cable. Uh, so if you really need continued surveillance, the USB, the USB cable is going to generate uh, less heat because you can turn off the Wi-Fi chipset, right? Right. But I believe that, especially with the Flow Tutors plugin that we're using right now, um, you, you may be able to go for many hours. Uh, we've been streaming for 47 minutes so far to YouTube, and it, it appears to be fine. Although the right. thermometer is on on the camera body. Uh huh. But we're still live streaming. I, I believe so. Go, go flow tours. That's great. Yeah. Uh, can I stream in 2K instead of 4K to reduce bandwidth? The driver uh, does support, or the camera does support 2K and 4K over the USB cable. If you're using a plugin, you have more control over it. So you could set it to a wider range of resolutions uh, to conserve bandwidth. But if you're going over the USB cable, uh, it's kind of locked to a specific, to either 2K 30 frames per second or 4K 30 frames per second. So the USB cable is not as flexible as the plug-in. I, I guess if you're writing the plug-in, you can just do whatever you want. Right, 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 right. Uh, I think we touched on this. Can I reduce the frame rate, rate below 30 frames per second? Uh, you can with the plug-in, but if it's going over the USB cable, the camera is going to output a 30 frames per second. So the that connection between the camera and the device that's connected to like a laptop or a robot or something is going to be uh, 30 frames per second. When you retransmit it, you can of course cut down the frame rate before you retransmit it over the internet. So let's say that's going to a Jetson Nano, right? You can, or a Windows laptop or a MacBook, right? So you're receiving 30 frames per second at that point of the computer, but when you retransmit it over the internet, you can cut down the frame rate using the software on that specific laptop, like uh, FFmpeg, for example, right? Got it, got it. Okay. 
or, or G streamer. It's pretty common. Can I stream from from within a sewer pipe? Uh, I think it's pretty difficult. Although people are doing it, the the problem is the you need a signal uh, from the camera to the point where you're viewing it. So let's say that you send the camera on a robot, it's most likely it's narrow, right? Down the sewer pipe. Uh, the Wi-Fi signal, is, you're gonna get a range of problems with the Wi-Fi signal. Uh, people are doing it, but I don't think it's, it's that easy. I think if you're streaming it on a stick, and it's kind of like almost a line of sight between you and the, the, you know, the, where the camera is, uh, it's probably doable. If you're trying to run a robot through it, other, other people have done it, um, I think it's pretty difficult, right? Uh, you may, you probably don't want to use a Wi-Fi chipset on the camera itself. You probably want to retransmit it too. So, well, it's impossible until someone does it, right? So, but I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it done reliably. Reliably, uh, okay. Well, I think people often, they just record the video, right? Yeah. On the robot, right? For the sewer and then they- View it later. But I think you can stream it yeah. in certain circumstances. Probably not recommended if you aren't super confident you can do it, basically. Yeah. Because you know, if you tell someone you can't do it, they're just going to stream it from the, the pipe, and it probably won't work. But maybe we'll take a conservative approach and say, uh, you know, if you're just trying to make a business or make some money, maybe don't con the stream. Right. Right. It's a more conservative approach. Uh, okay, so we talked about sur uh, sewers and other low light places. Yeah. How do you light up a 360 degree? Oh, you've seen a bunch too, right? You want to take this question? I have. Uh, so there are um, LED um, products that are available. Yeah. Yeah. There are LED strips that maybe you can, as part of your robot, maybe right. the connector area goes around it. So yeah. it's at the base of the Theta. Yeah. It lights up in 360. Yeah. So it's like the Fox Sewer Rover, right? The Fox Sewer Rover. And that research group on the East Coast was doing the same thing, right? Yeah, they I were. I guess it's pretty common to do this LED light strip around it. LED light strip. Yeah. And uh, we've recently talked with some companies who are coming out with even uh, smaller, thinner <coughs> solutions. Um, they haven't come up with it yet. We can't talk about it. <laughs> um, <coughs> I believe it's not quite out. It's coming out. Um, so there's some commercial product, products that are coming out specifically for 360 cameras. Yeah, I think um, some are bulky, and maybe the main um, technique is to make it small and yep. unobtrusive, so it's not in the, you know, the vast majority of yep. the, the video. Yeah. So, but uh, there are these uh, basically LED strips. Awesome. I, I've also wasn't like Cola Builder and stuff. They had these like round, kind of circular lights. Yeah. That they're using for construction. Yeah. In construction. Are, are there some camping lights that look like that? I think there's even one. It's on. Uh, Hollow Builder does it. There's also a company that I think just sells the light. Oh, yeah. Or basically, it's below the camera and on top of the monopod. Oh, it's like a, it's like a spacer almost, right? Oh, it's almost yeah, like I a spacer. One too. And it's a, it's a light. <coughs> um, so it's pretty much in line. You don't lose very much down. At the nadir, at the bottom of yeah, the yeah. 360 sphere, uh, yeah, the, uh, that's one solution. Basically, I think a lot of lights are kind of circular. I, I think there's many different solutions for this, right? Yeah. So the one that was sticking down the sewer pipe. Yeah. Where was it in relation to the camera? Was it below the camera? Yeah. Like below, like where the uh, the bottom being like where the uh, the tripod mount is, right? Basically there, right. below so the tripod the mount. The technique is you you put some type of like light between the monopod and the camera. Yep, that's, that's exactly, one technique. That's exactly it. And then the, the 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 ring it goes below the camera too. It also goes below the camera. Okay. I so wonder what the difference between ring and like a like a, a cylinder, right? Yeah. Because the the ring's much bigger. Yep. Then so if if the cylinder itself produces enough light, why not just use a cylinder? It seems more streamlined. Yeah, it does. The, the one in the sewer, it was kind of narrow, right? Yeah. Probably for industrial use, the uh, more narrow, uh, you probably don't need that wide ring, right? But Yeah, I think you maybe don't need or don't want the wider ring. The less space, the better. Okay. 
Well, we've been streaming for an hour. Fantastic. With Flow Tours HDR wireless live streaming using a HDR if we're rectangular. Yeah. Right. So it's 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 been processing more inside the camera because we're testing the HDR. Right. So it has to process the different frames. Yeah. Um, so this was a great test. Hopefully, we'll get a great archive from this. And thanks to Laszlo yeah. and the team, his team yeah. at Flow Tours for helping us get this set up. That's yeah. fantastic. If you have any more questions about live streaming with Ricoh Theta, uh, the theta360.guide is a great place to come. There's lots of information. There's a forum. Come ask your questions. We'll try and help. Okay. Thanks so much for everyone that participate. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye.